Okay guys, hello everybody, my name is Vitaly Neymer, um, I'm an international master and serving as the Grand Master Resident here at the St. Louis Chess Club. Uh, today is going to be one of uh, my most exciting videos I'm going to uh, provide to the Chess Club and to the world, to our YouTube channel. Uh, and today we are going to discuss something very, very fascinating, uh, which is uh, engine chess, uh, computer chess. As we know, the technology is surrounding all of us today. Um, you know, we have it in our finger, uh, fingers, we have the phones, laptops, computers, cars, everything is uh, computerized today. Without computers today, we cannot survive. Uh, I mean, we can't go, go but uh, anyway. Um, so today I would like to discuss a very specific match which happened just a few months, months ago. Uh, between um, two softwares, uh, AlphaZero and Stockfish. Now, just before um, we start with the, with the game itself, I actually like to discuss some of the details uh, that, that about uh, chess engines. Uh, the first chess, chess engine was actually introduced in the 1960s, uh, around 1960s, 1970s. Back then, uh, that the, the chess engines are, were very, very weak. Uh, pretty much everybody could beat them, uh, as well as the hard hardware was not that strong. Uh, as we know, probably 50 years ago, uh, one computer was in the size of a whole room. Uh, today we have computers in the size of, you know, it's in our phones, it's on our laptops, uh, but we, but we we probably, I don't remember this, but 50 years ago, the first computers that were invented were so, so big and slow as well. So this is where, where uh, chess engines were, when they were born in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, since then, like every piece of technology that we have in our lives, um, it got promoted, it got advanced, uh, it got uh, faster, uh, more powerful, and um, one of the biggest changes in engine chess between engines and humans happened in 1997. And in 1997, we had uh, the uh, very famous uh, match uh, between IBM's uh, Deep Blue and Gary Kasparov. And what happened in that match is that uh, Gary Kasparov lost the match. It was a six-game a six match. Gary Kasparov lost uh, three and a half, two and a half. Now, why was it so important that that match? Well, first of all, it was not the first time when a human lost to an engine. It was not the first time when uh, humans beat an engine. Uh, but it was the first time when in a very, very, um, a very media-covered match, uh, official match, uh, a very strong game master at the time, uh, Gary Kasparov, was treated as you know as almost as Magnus Carlsen today. He was on the top of the world, uh, world champion back then, and th so this was pretty much the first time when, when such an important chess player lost uh, lost to an engine. Uh, so this was in 1997. Uh, by the way, a small a small story about about the match itself. Um, after the match. Uh, if you, if you see today, for example, IBM uh, does not produce any more chess engines. Uh, IBM decided to go away from the chess world, and there is a good reason for that. So what happened is actually, uh, after the match was ended, um, Kasparov uh, blamed uh, IBM uh, that the match was unfair. And so why, why, how was the, the match unfair? Well, besides the fact that the machine that, that, at the time could calculate faster, but it was all about the preparation. As you know, uh, today we have databases of, of chess games uh, that are uh, accessible to almost everybody. You can go online and, and try to prepare for your opponent. So what happened is that before the match, obviously both teams, Kasparov teams and IBM teams were trying to prepare against each other. However, um, Kasparov's game were online, so the IBM's team could look at his games and prepare for to those games. Uh, 
and for example they can make some adjustments to the software saying okay in this opening he might be weak in this opening he might be strong so let's let's play uh, let's make the engine play against the the more uh, weaker side of, of Kasparov however when Gary Kasparov asked to uh, from <laughs> IBM to provide uh, the blues engine uh, chess games uh, they refused to do so so you can kind of see if, uh, how it might be unfair um, you know you know what I know what you are playing you don't know what I'm playing it's not exactly equal so back then uh, you know Casper was uh, we didn't have Facebook or Twitter if as far as I remember but even then when somebody with a name like uh, Gary uh, you know went to the media and and you know uh, announced uh, <laughs> those accusations uh, obviously uh, it created some negative aspect to IBM and uh, they decided to uh, to get to get out of the chess world so this is just a, a small story uh, <laughs> about that match okay so since then uh, since 1997 uh, once the match was won by, by IBM uh, people still tried to beat engines uh, we tried to beat them uh, lots of players uh, played against them in the matches. Uh, Vladimir Kramnik, uh, Vichy Anand, uh, Topalov. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. Uh, basically, we're going head to head against against machines and see what happens. <coughs> now, the next uh, most important thing happened in about the year of 2005. Uh, in the year of 2005, there was a new engine uh, came out. Uh, and the engine's name was Ripka. Ripka translating from, uh, from Russian, it means a small fish. Now, to be honest, I have no idea why they called it a small fish. I guess it's just imagination of the people who created the engine itself. Uh, but that, that was the engine. Now, what was special about that engine <laughs> is that uh, it was a little bit more creative and um, it got to the rating of 3000 uh, points LO. Uh, so just to compare with with every uh, with what we have today with the other chess players that we have today, uh, Magnus Carlsen and the top chess players in the world are about 2800, 2850 or 60 was kind of the the record that we hit that we hit. And uh, obviously, once an engine uh, hits that 3000 mark, uh, well, no man can can ever beat that. And that's pretty much what happened. For, uh, from, to, from the year of 2005, uh, no man could uh, beat on equal terms the, the engines. Now we tried uh, to, uh, to, to make some, some matches between, uh, between uh, humans and engines, but uh, the engines would have to be in a, some kind of a disadvantage. Uh, for example, we would start with a pawn up or two pawns up, but uh, even a few matches were uh, conducted between grandmasters and chess engines and grandmaster got two pawns up uh, and even then the grandmasters lost the match and two pawns is, is a lot it's a, it's a big advantage not just one so so really after 2005 uh, we, we never had the chance to beat them now uh, going going to this uh, to this to nowadays how how are the uh, let's let's look at first of all at the uh, chess engines today that we have if you go to this website it's called the computerchess.org.uk uh, uh, this basically this uh, this website this website um, has all the chess uh, the chess engines available today at least the top ones as you can see it is being updated pretty much almost a, f a few days uh, this number 4040 means that they play between themselves 40 moves uh, 40 minutes to 40 moves and basically this uh, is how uh, the rating of the chess engines um, is is being made uh, they play against themselves okay they play against themselves in a chess tournament which is called a TC uh, EC and this is its website uh, <laughs> TCC where um, that means uh, the top chess engine championship and every year just like a world championship uh, for human we have the world championship uh, for engines just to decide which engine is the current uh, is the be best one 
So as you can see today, um, that the chess engine, uh, the ch that chess engine that I was discussing, Ripka, is only number 17 on the on the list. Uh, I mean, how how can it be? I, I remember in 2005, I was one in my tr I would say prime years of my chess, um, my youth my youth years. I was very young, uh, energetic. And I remember that uh, when this engine Ripka came out, um, I used to have a coach and that coach immediately got this, uh, he bought this chess engine and I remember him saying, uh, well, Vitali, from now on, you have to do everything with Ripka. You have to analyze your games with Ripka, you have to listen to Ripka, you have to play against Ripka, you're going to become world champion by training with Ripka all the time. Well, uh, as you can see, I'm not a world champion. Um, and uh, for me, it was very difficult uh, always to play against, against computers, against chess engines, although some people do like it. I really prefer to play, um, you know, again, to play against people. Uh, I guess I like to, to see uh, during the game when you make a combination or anything like that, I like to see the, you know, I guess people uh, kind of struggling, you know, uh, sweating on the chessboard. If you beat a chess engine, you just don't have the same satisfaction. Uh, so this is why I never was I was never able to uh, to play against chess engines so much, but definitely some people use it, use them for training. So Ripka today is only number seventeen with only uh, thirty one hundred fifty four rating points uh, LO. So what happened? Well, uh, lots of people are, uh, it's a competition. Lots of people try to get into this field, and as you can see nowadays we have lots and lots of chess engines today. Um, I'm going to just to focus on the first, on the top uh, three engines. As you can see, um, the, the top three engines are Stockfish, Houdini, and Komodo. Um, they are all with 3,400 uh, rating points, which is a lot. Obviously, the, the number four, Shredder, is 3,200. But um, there is a difference of about, of about 100 points. And in those levels, the 3,400, this is a big, big uh, difference of 100 points. We, for us, it doesn't really matter if we, if we use them, but in, in those uh, stages, it's, 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 um, it's a pretty big difference. Uh, so if you do use an engine at home to analyze your games, I would suggest you uh, choose one of the top three. Now, um, let's discuss about those colors here. Th those are quite, uh, quite interesting to see. As you can see, um, the, the blue ones are the commercial engines. Commercial engines pretty much say, okay, well, if you want to, if you want to get it, you, if you want to get it, you need to pay. Right? I mean, lots of people are working to, to create those engines, so that makes sense. The second one, the green ones, uh, they are the ones who are free. Basically, you can go online and you can download that, that engine. And the last one is Probably the best one. This is the orange ones. They are the open source. Um, so what does it mean open source? Basically open source means it, it is free. You can go out there and download the engine, but you can also make changes to the chess engine. So for example, you can say, well, maybe I like to play more tactical uh, chess. Maybe I like to, uh, to sacrifice a lot. So you can make, so you can actually go to the code of the of the software, and you can make some changes. Uh, hopefully, you know what you are doing, uh, but that that's pretty much the the case. And as you can see, the number one chess engine today, is Stockfish, uh, is uh, is an open source, and he's number one. Why is that? Well, because people, everybody besides the team who is working to improve Stockfish, uh, us, we also there are lots of people out in the world. Uh, come in and, and try to, to improve the engine itself as well. So it's not surprising that Stockfish, uh, you know, kind of considered the, the world champion as, as of today. Okay, so this is pretty much about, uh, about uh, chess engines and, and history. And uh, since, again, since 2005, uh, we, have, we had a few teams working on chess engines and Stockfish is the world champion. But then we had a new event coming in in December of 2017, just four months ago, and um, this uh, this was a, was a huge buzz on the news. Uh, this match, and um, 
I would like to discuss it more because I think that uh, people don't really realize how much impact it had. Um, some people uh, liked the match, some people uh, criticized the match. Uh, so let's see what happened. So in 2017, um, as we know, uh, Google uh, had um, in their laboratories um, working on what they call artificial intelligence. And uh, not only Google is working on that, we have uh, Microsoft, uh, we have uh, even Uber, lots of, lots of uh, big companies today, everybody has their own artificial intelligent engine or software, uh, hardware, whatever you guys want to call that. Google's uh, called their, um, their artificial intelligence DeepMind. And uh, they wanted to see how, how, how is the artificial intelligence is doing against, uh, you know, against humans or against engines. Now, uh, probably what they said, the Google said is that, well, if uh, our chess engine, artificial intelligence beats uh, the top chess engine in the world, well, definitely he's going to beat uh, any, any person because the chess engine's stockfish today is, is beating any person today. So this is how AlphaZero was born. Uh, AlphaZero, the, uh, the chess, uh, the artificial intelligence, Google's uh, chess engine. So uh, besides AlphaZero, we also, um, uh, we, Google also created another uh, engine. It's uh, called AlphaGo. Uh, AlphaGo is, the, um, is another uh, engine which is uh, for the Go game. The Go game is very, very popular in China. Uh, there is actually um, there is a, a, a very interesting uh, documentary film on, on Netflix today. Uh, you can watch it. Uh, it's uh, basically it's uh, about AlphaGo uh, beating the world champion in, in the Go game. Uh, in that movie, they even say that uh, Go might be more complicated game than than chess. Well, um, as a chess player, I would disagree. I guess I'm biased. Uh, but um, in that match, the, the world champion uh, only succeeded to, to beat uh, AlphaGo one time. And I think that he lost three or four games and he, lo he lost the match. Uh, not sure. I don't think that there are any draws over there. So, uh, so in AlphaGo, he beat him uh, and, you know, we... Uh, we have seen many times you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, as of today, we, uh, we see artificial intelligence in, um, in Uber or, or in other, uh, pretty much every, uh, every uh, car, car manufacturer is trying to, uh, to make uh, autonomous cars, right? So we don't need to drive them, so the car is gonna drive itself, uh, but, uh, you know, we already have uh, those kind of en engines. We have them in airplanes, we have them in elevators, in cars. Um, so it seems like robots are, are pretty much better than us. Uh, you know, they are faster than us, they are stronger than us. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, seems, it's, it seems pretty strange. Um, do you guys think that uh, we st as humans, are we still any better than robots? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think that uh, one of the things that we might still beat uh, robots is imagination. That's uh, that's one thing. Uh, and one of my students also said um, emotions. We have emotions, but uh, robots don't, even AI. But even today, um, I know that some artificial intelligence uh, softwares, they are working on uh, creating art and composing music. So we are not that far, not that far uh, into the into the future, if you guys saw the uh, uh, the famous Terminator movie, um, so obviously lots of lots of people uh, kind of afraid of the future. Um, I say you know embrace the future, and uh, you know, wor wor worst case we have Arnold, right? Arnold is going to come and save us. <laughs> uh, but for example, um, I just said in the news. Uh, you know we have this we have this issue uh, of global warming. Uh, everybody knows it's coming. Everybody knows that at some point uh, we might be doomed. But actually, they are using artificial intelligence in order to find a solution 
for that problem? What if you use what if you use DeepMind to to solve uh, to solve global you know economic issues or health issues? What if uh, artificial intelligence uh, is going to um, you know cure cancer to help in in doing that? And that's uh, those are the benefits as well. So we don't have to only be be scared by that. Okay. Anyway, so back to the match. Uh, Alpha Zero uh, teams approached, uh, you know, they played a, a privately held match uh, versus Stockfish. Um, so again, it's not, it was not part of the TCEC uh, championship. It was privately held. And they uh, played against themselves 100 games. Uh, and the result was, uh, is that uh, Alpha Zero won 28 games and drew 72 games with zero losses. Now, it sounds pretty devastating. In my opinion, though, it's not as de devastating. If you think about it, if, if one of us is going to play a 100-game match against Magnus Carlsen, and we lose 28 times, but we, uh, uh, but we draw 72 times, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. Now, from that, in that, from that match, there were only 10 games which were released to the public. Only 10 games. Um, so, wh why were only 10 games were released to the public out of those 100 games? Anybody knows? Yes, please. Uh, so, that people can't copy them? So, people cannot copy the engines? Yeah. Okay, interesting idea. Well, I think that the idea of releasing only 10 games is because in those, in all of those ten games, uh, Alpha Zero won. So when you release only the games that the, that that Alpha Zero won, that's why people thought that Alpha Zero destroyed Stockfish. But it's not true. I mean, there were so many draws as well. Um, so they're tr they're trying just to amplify the effect, that, that emotion that okay, he's he's the strongest one, and probably those wins were also the most beautiful ones as well. Um, I wish that we could that we could see the other games as well. I, I'm not sure if they will be, ever be released to the public, but uh, I would be really interested to see what happened there. Now, usually the, the the chess engine matches are pretty boring, I have to say. Um, you know, it's lots of draws. Uh, but this game that I selected today, um, I call it um, the ultimate machine war. Uh, this is my uh, personal favorite. I think this uh, game uh, is one of the most beautiful games that ever played. And um, why, wh why would I want to show this game? What can we learn from this game? Well, first of all, um, I think that no one today can become a strong chess player without the usage of technology. Things like uh, databases and engines and, and uh, game analysis. And if we, if we try to, to operate this, those engines and look at uh, what he's doing on the chessboard, um, it will probably help us understand them better, okay, while using them. Now, number two is, uh, you know, every, every time I watch, uh, I watch commentaries and there is live uh, transmission of games and people, there are lots of comments on different websites, uh, there is usually also a chess engine involved and uh, he's showing his lines. And I always, I always see one of those comments. Well, this is a, this is a, an engine move. Like we have no idea why he's suggesting this move, but this is, it's an engine move. And I want to show you that even, uh, even uh, chess engines, they have, they have the, their ideas. Uh, every move has a reason. Okay, and uh, the plans that Alpha Zero played in this game uh, were quite, quite remarkable, and we can use them in our games. And uh, the third one. Uh, the third reason why I want to show you this game is because of the opening uh, choice that is played by, by uh, Alpha Zero. Uh, by the way, from now on, uh, I'm going to refer to Alpha Zero as AZ. It's just going to be easier for me. AZ versus SF. Okay, so opening a patrol. As we know, that even uh, that uh, the first move that we make in a chess game uh, might, might change uh, the course of the game. We know, for example, you know, some, some moves are just giving us some kind of a, uh, just maybe very minor advantage. Maybe I can start with b3. It doesn't mean that white is losing his advantage uh, because the bishop can be fanchetted on b2. It's still useful, but uh, white will not get the advantage. 
However, if white starts with the first move g4, for example, well, we know immediately that white is in disadvantage. Black is actually, it's better for, for us to play black, even though we are the second one uh, to move. Why is that? Well, because of g4 becomes a weakness. Um, and in addition, f4 and h4 also becomes weaknesses. So in the chess, in the chess world, we know for sure that e4, d4, sometimes c4, and knight f3 are the best options, right? This is the, the, those are the most common moves for us to start the game. But even then, uh, there's probably some kind of a difference between those moves. I mean, one of those moves has to be better. Uh, right, because it's a, it's a, it's kind of a mathematical equation. One of them has to has to be better, right? So it's interesting to see what um, what Alpha Zero's choice was. Now there was a, a research paper which was published together with those games, and you can find the, this this research research paper over here. And um, basically, it shows us it sh the research paper showed a few diagrams. And here are the diagrams. So they took the, uh, you know, the most uh, popular uh, openings. And basically, they wanted to see which one, ones would be preferred by uh, alpha zero. And as you can see here, uh, for example, if the graph is going up, that means that he likes, he likes the opening and he plays it more and more. If the graph is not showing almost at all, for example, the king's Indian defense, the kid, um, that means that he doesn't like the opening. So, um, it's very, very interesting to see, uh, uh, you know, the choice of opening that Alpha Zero chooses because, after all, he's almost the world champion. Okay, so in this match, uh, one more thing to mention: there were uh, basically three differences between Alpha Zero and and Stockfish. Uh, first of all, the speed. The speed uh, Alpha Zero could calculate eighty thousand positions per second versus. 70 million positions uh, of, st of Stockfish. Uh, that means that Alpha Zero is slower. Hmm, very interesting. How can a slower engine beat somebody who is faster? We're going to discuss it today. Uh, number two, uh, one of the most big biggest one, is the learning time. The learning time, uh, as you know, Stockfish is an engine which was developed by humans. It was developed all uh, over the course of a few years, five or 10 years. Now, however, uh, Stockfish had only four hours to learn chess. The, basically, they gave them the moves and said, okay, you're on your own right now. So only four hours. It's pretty much like uh, I would teach my four-year-old sister how to play chess in, in four hours, and she's going to beat Magnus. Now, that's, that's pretty much uh, putting it in our, in our perspective. And number three is the, uh, is the database usage. Again, similar to what happened in the IBM's uh, match with Gary Kasparov. Uh, Stockfish had, had access to the database, which is very useful, as you, as you probably know, and uh, AlphaZero did not. However, what AlphaZero did in those four hours is that it played against himself for four hours. It created his own database. That's quite amazing. It's pretty much like I'm going to say to you, okay, you are watching this video, you're going to stay in your room for the rest of your life, you can live forever, you won't have access to anything else besides just a regular chessboard. How would you improve? Well, you're going to play against yourself. Pretty boring, but you'll still improve. Okay, so let's see what happened in the game. This, uh, this ultimate machine war game that I selected today. In this game, um, Alpha Zero decides to play Knight of 3. As we've seen, um, Alpha Zero decides not to, pl to play less and less E4. Uh, uh, e4, the e4 move is less common for alpha zero. Now, what about knight f3? How do we decide between knight f3, d4, and c4? Well, technically, those those three moves complement each other. We know that we can have a transposition of moves between knight f3, c4, and d4. For example, lots of pl players play d4 first, uh, d5, then c4, and then knight f3 at some moment. So we can kind of get a transposition of moves. So he decides to start with knight f3. Knight f6 was played by Stockfish, and now c4. So right now we are in the ready defense. b6 played by Stockfish, d4, and e6. Okay, so we transposed 
into the Queen's Indian defense and the, uh, uh, one of the most solid uh, uh, openings. I actually played uh, with black myself a few times. Um, pretty, pretty good opening for black and for white as well. Okay, so here uh, there are lots of options for white. White can either develop the knight on c3, uh, you can also play, try to play a3, but white decides to play g3 to Fanchetto his bishop. And I have to say to you that um, since becoming a professional coach, um, for the most of my life I've been playing e4 myself, and today I'm trying to um, explore new openings. And um, I had this debate with myself, what do I teach my, uh, my students? It was about a year ago. Do I teach more e4, do I teach d4, or something else? And this is when I came up with a new opening, uh, which I call the Hydra system. And uh, surprisingly, Alpha Zero is actually playing really, really, uh, really similar to the Hydra system. So I was very happy to see that. It's almost like I was like uh, winning the, the million dollars, the bingo. So G3, and now Bishop A6. In this position, if I flip the board, Black has two main options. He needs to fancher the Bishop to B7 or to A6. Now, both of those moves considered pretty good. Um, usually, I tell my students, always uh, ask yourself, what is the damage? What, what is the weakness of my opponent's last move? Not only the goal, but what's the weakness? The weakness of, of White's uh, last move, uh, g3, is that we know that the bishop is probably going, going to go on to g2. When the bishop is going to go to g2, the bishop is no longer going to defend the c4 pawn. So this is why bishop a6 was played, uh, immediately attacking the, the c4 pawn. Okay, so how should, how should white reply? The main line here, the most popular line according to the database, is b3. This is the main line, uh, def just defending the pawn with a pawn, and then bishop goes to b4 check, and then uh, bishop d2, bishop e7, and eventually, black is going to play something like d5, c6, and get a pretty comfortable position. Well, this is where we see a first deviation uh, by alpha zero, and alpha zero played this move queen to c2. Uh, queen c2 is a very common uh, move in the queen's gambit, in the queen's pawn openings. There are pretty much th three ideas why white wants to play the move queen c2. Uh, the first one is simply to defend the pawn on c4. The second one is that he, he wants to defend the, pawn, the square e4. Uh, and the third one is that eventually white wants to bring one of his rooks to the d-file, just in front of the queen on uh, d8. So for example, if black tries to play very passively, like bishop to e7, then white can play something like e4 immediately and then castle i can even push e5 and then i can choose between bishop g2 and bishop to d3 and white has a very big space advantage uh, which will give him the upper hand in the game okay so queen c2 was just played uh, in the game and this is not a novelty though uh, thousands of games that were played by by white playing this move queen c2 I had to face this myself as black a few times. Well, again, what is the disadvantage of this move? Queen to c2 is that it is less defending the default pawn. And this is why many times in the uh, uh, Queen's Indian and in the Ninzu Indian, black is using this move c5, which was played by, uh, by Stockfish, uh, immediately attacking the, uh, the pawn on d4. Well, what, how do we usually reply to this move on c5? We can either ignore the threat, so let's say we can play something like bishop to g2, just ignore it. We can defend the pawn, maybe with e3, or we can take on c5, or we can play pawn to d5. So which one is the best? So in order to answer this question, I would like to share with you something that I share with my students today. If we go to the first position in, on the chessboard, 
and let's say white plays d4 first move, which is one of the popular moves, and black plays c5, goes to the Benoni defense. What will be the best move here for white? Yes. D5. Exactly, that is correct. Not to defend the pawn, not for the pawn, not for the knight, not to take the pawn because then the bishop is going to take on c5, but d5. This move d5 is uh, intended to expand uh, our space, and we get a space advantage. Also, black cannot, can no longer take his knight out uh, to c6. Well, similarly, as I said, in the game, uh, alpha zero is, is following my plan, my system, with the, uh, the hydro system, and he plays again d5. Now, it looks like a sacrifice, this move d5. Now, first of all, if black does not take the pawn, again, we know that after bishop e7, for example, white will play e4 and get the, get the advantage. So black takes on d5, pawn takes on d5, and now, of course, black cannot, cannot take on, d, on d5. This is just a, a small trap. Uh, why is that? Well, because of a simple check. Queen e4. The queen, uh, the queen checks the king, and uh, if, if, if we block with the bishop or with the queen, then we lose the knight, and if we block with the knight, then we lose the rookie on e8. Pretty simple to see, but uh, not so obvious. Uh, I had a few games that, uh, online blitz games, that I caught a few, a few players on, uh, with this trap. So, knight takes d5 is bad. So black decides to retreat with his bishop to b7 uh, in order to attack the, the pawn again. Now this is technically a variation for white which is a gambit, uh, which means that white sacrifices a pawn uh, in, this, in this variation. Now why do I have to sacrifice it now? Because if I play e4 here and try to defend the pawn uh, uh, with all of my strength, then black can simply play this move queen e7. Queen e7 is going to attack this pawn on e4, and not only to attack this pawn, but even if we try to defend it with bishop d3, for example, we are going, black is going to take this pawn on d5, using the pin that was created on the king. So e4 doesn't work now. Well, what else do we have to do? We have to keep on developing our pieces. So, bishop to g2 was played. Now, for example, if uh, black has, has a dilemma, he needs to figure out, do I want to take this pawn with a bishop? Do I want to take this, bishop, this pawn with a knight? Uh, what do I do? Well, I have to take this pawn. Now, the correct move is knight taking on, on d5. Now, why is the bishop taking on d5 no, not so good? Uh, although it looks much more logical to immediately put the bishop in front of our bishop, it's because white can play this move knight to c3. After knight c3, Basically, black is losing a tempo. Um, he has to retreat the bishop. He cannot give up the bishop. Otherwise, this, uh, the h1, a8 diagonal would be just too, uh, too weak. And so he will have to waste another move. And so that, that does not make lots of sense for black. So he usually takes uh, with the knight. So knight takes d5. White just castles. Uh, black just develops his pieces. Knight c6 and rook to d1. As we said, uh, that was one of the ideas of queen c2. So we saw this, again, this move, defending c4, uh, this controlling e4 square and bringing the rook to d1. Very, very uh, common in uh, queen spawn uh, defenses, openings. Okay, although white is attacking this knight on d5, black has no time to defend the knight. And black is playing this move bishop to e7. Bishop to e7 was played. Uh, still, it's, it's one of the main lines. It's, again, it's not a novelty yet. We are move number 10. It's v all very known. Uh, very f not, not very forced, but pretty much uh, uh, the main line. And uh, the idea is that white cannot, cannot take on d5. And this is simply because black would play knight to b4. Forking the rook and the queen. And he's going to take the, the rook next, next time. Just a small trap for, for white as well. So, in this position, white has tried many, many moves, such as a3 to defend the b4, the b4 square, 
knight c3 to attack the, the knight on d5, uh, e4, the same idea, and a bunch of queen moves. Queen b3, queen a4, queen c4, queen d3, queen e4, queen e4 and queen, queen to f5. Bunch and bunch of uh, queen moves. Uh, obviously, every move with the queen, I will either attack the knight on d5, or will take away the queen from the fork that was created. Uh, alpha zero uh, chooses queen to a queen to f5. Queen to f5, not only attacking the knight here on, on d5, but also looking at those uh, pawns on h7, f7, d7 <coughs> as well. So, and now black does need to retreat his knight. Knight f6 was played, and now e4. It's important to mention that this move e4, although it looks like it is blocking our bishop, which is not so good for us, but if the, if the, uh, the pawn on uh, is still dynamic, which means that he can still move forward or be exchanged, uh, this, th this will be pretty good. And the, obviously the idea is to play e5. For example, if black tries to castle here, which looks uh, like a logical move, then we play e5, the knight has to move, and then uh, black is losing the d7, the d7 pawn. So black is playing g6, attacking the queen. Queen f4 is uh, being played, and now castle. And the idea that after e5, black can move his knight uh, to h5 with a tempo on the queen. The queen goes to g4. Still one of the main lines. Uh, in this position. Now we see a first deviation by Stockfish. The main line for black here is to play this queen b8. Uh, by the way, when I say the main line, it means that it's the most popular line. This is what was played the most common uh, in the database. So queen b8 is the main line. The idea is simply if, uh, if white takes here with the queen, then uh, the rook can come to d8 and skewer us nice little trap and if we take here with a rook on d7 then black can play bishop c8 also nice little skewer this is the main line well a stockfish decides to, to deviate a little, a little bit and plays rook to e8 rook to e8 was played it's just a transposition of moves knight c3 knight played queen b8 and knight to d5 always move forward uh, the knight on d5 is very, very powerful. Uh, also, it creates a small trap. If black takes on e5, then knight takes on e5, queen takes e5, check, and bishop takes on b7. How, how, do, we, how do we see it, uh, by the way? Uh, if I would ask the question, well, why is knight e5 is a bad move? Well, the way we see it is that we have to calculate the forcing lines first, which are checks, which are captures, which are threats. We look at them first. Uh, and this is one of the, w one of the uh, reasons uh, why Alpha Zero is stronger, although he was slower. Bec uh, he's stronger because he's more efficient. For example, in this position, maybe Alpha Zero would say, okay, I'm gonna look at the checks first. Queen takes g g6, it doesn't work. Then I'm gonna look at the captures first and so on and so on. Now, on the other hand, Stockfish would calculate this position and he would, maybe he would, he would just go systematically from left to right. Let's say he's gonna start with this pawn. a3, a4, b3, b4, rook b1, bishop d2, bishop e3, and so far and, uh, and so on, okay? So the idea was that this alpha zero is just much more efficient. Uh, if the forcing lines don't work, then we go going to go into something more positional. So obviously Stockfish did, does not fall into this easy trap. He plays bishop to f8. Again, the, the idea of bishop to f8, we know that there is a reason for behind every move. I retreat my, my, my bishop. I want to bring my bishop to Fanchetto him. And most importantly, now I bring in the rook to attack the, the pawn on e5. Bishop f4 was played by, by Alpha Zero. I just, wanna, I just want to uh, develop my, my bishop. Knight takes f4 is impossible because What's the weakness of this move, knight f4? Is that he gi it gives out, gives up this uh, square on f6, so we can check him 
with a fork. Pretty easy to see for, for engines, but for us, uh, the thinking process would, would help here. So queen c8 uh, was played to get out the queen out of, out of this diagonal. Otherwise, e6 might have been coming. And now white made this uh, little bit of a strange move. He played this move h3. Hmm, this move h3. Why do we need this move h3? I mean, usually uh, when we play h3, it's uh, when we are not fair and shadowed and we are just trying to get a luft for the king, a window for him to escape. After, after analyzing this game for, for, for many, many uh, times, um, I understood that Black's, uh, that Black's uh, idea was actually to somehow move the pawn at some point and exchange the queens. Because if we exchange, let's say if I take out the queens here off the board right now, uh, Black will be with a pawn up, and the weaknesses that we have with, with, uh, with a king here will not be so substantial. They won't be felt as much. So this was the idea, to defend the queen in case black is going to try to exchange queens. Knight e7, as you can see in, the, uh, in this position, uh, if I flip the board just for a second, you will see that black really does not have a lot of space. And uh, it's very important in chess to, to, have, uh, to have space uh, because otherwise you, 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 your pieces won't uh, find the, uh, the best squares and pretty much uh, Stockfish is, is uh, uh, feeling probably like a tuna in a can. Fish tuna? You guys got it? <laughs> okay, so knight e7, he's trying to exchange some, uh, some pieces. Knight e3. Look at this very, very amazing prophylactic move. Black wants to exchange uh, the knight, he wants to jump to f5, and white says, uh-uh, no way, I'm going to play knight e3, I'm going to prevent the exchange of knights, and I'm going to prevent the knight from coming to f5. And this is really what I, what I think was one of the beauties of uh, Alpha Zero artificial intelligence, is that he does play, play very creatively. He does understand positional chess. Uh, what does it mean, a prophylaxis, and we will we will see it more coming in. Bishop c c6 was played to defend this pawn on d7 because after we moved the rook uh, is attacking the, uh, the d7 pawn. And now rook to d6. A, ni a nice blockhead with the rook. As human for us it will be very difficult to, to make such a move because we usually don't like to put the rook in front of the bishop. However, uh, it's also about the concrete uh, the concrete uh, uh, calculation. We know that the knight cannot move anywhere because it's going to get taken on the 5 and d5. So the rook feels pretty good here. Knight g7 was played. Again, the idea is to bring this knight to f5. So how do we prevent this? We play rook to f6. Look, look where uh, this beautiful rook is. Usually we don't see it. And a very nice rook lift. 1, 2, and 3. Queen b7 was played by uh, Stockfish, bishop h6. So now uh, white decides, okay, this bishop on f4 is, has finished his job. His job was to defend the pawn here on e5. The job was to attack the queen here on b8. So let's try to annoy the king. Bishop h6, knight d5, and finally uh, black succeeds in exchanging a few pieces. Now, he did exchange a few pieces. It does feel better. However, uh, now... Well, after exchanging the dark square bishop, uh, those weaknesses really, really going to come into play in the future. And this is exactly what Alpha Zero says. Okay, he says, okay, you have those weaknesses. Let's 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 go and let's go and visit you over there. Let's see what's what's going to happen. So Queen H4. The immediate threat, by the way, is again an action move. Uh, an action move. Queen Queen H4. I attack here on H7. I want to bring my knight to g5. For example, if black just plays a6, knight g5, I want to checkmate you on h7, knight takes, and now bishop takes on d5. Simply winning a piece. So, this is why Stockfish played bishop c6. So far, uh, I think that I have explained every move that was played by Stockfish and every move that was played by AlphaZero. So no surprises. 
queen h6, queen is coming in, rook a e8, and rook to d6. And now look at this nice blockading position. This is what we call a positional sacrifice. Sacrifice the pawn to get the, our pieces much, much more active. Rook d6 also has a, has a threat. We played here. The threat is, if I play just a random move like a6, is to take this knight. And if the pawn takes, let's say here, or rook takes, or anybody else, again, we have this move knight to g5. There is no defense from the mate on h7. Rook e7 does not work because of rook takes on f8 checkmate. So, uh, Stockfish sees that threat and he decides, okay, I'm going to take the, the knight here on f3. He's just too dangerous. Bishop takes f3 and queen to a6. The queen comes out of the threat and also attacking the a2 pawn. And now... Uh, Alpha Zero decides to create another very creative plan, which we have seen. We see this more and more often, uh, even in, the, in this candidate uh, tournament. Uh, we saw it this round today, uh, played by Karyakin, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where he played this move, h4. Suddenly, we attack on the h file. Very, very uh, peculiar idea. I mean, usually we are taught in chess that we have to do everything in the center, center. And suddenly we go h4, uh, very strange. Well, here's the idea. If the queen takes on a2, then we play h5, and basically we expose the h file. Take, and if check, if it takes on g6, then now we have this elevator down. Rook to d1, attacking the queen, and preparing rook h1, and a checkmate on h8. There's basically no defense against that. So Stockfish sees that and he plays queen a5. Uh, he's trying to put his queen here on e1, checking and taking the e5 pawn. If we lose the e5 pawn, the e5 pawn is uh, almost like a glue in the position, and we cannot do that. So uh, alpha, uh, az comes back with the rook to rook d1, c4, rook d5, again defending the pawn on e5 and attacking the queen. Queen e1 check, king g2, c3, we, have, we, have see, we see a few exchanges, h5, everything goes by the plan. Still white is a pawn down, but his pieces look a bit nicer, his king is safer. Rook e7, and now white decides that uh, his bishop on f3 is not so good. If I would ask uh, many people uh, well, which, which piece is, is looks bad for white, it would be definitely not the bishop. Looks good, right? It defends the, the rook, defends the pawn, but really it has nobody to attack. Usually when we fetch out the bishop, we want to attack the rook here on a8, there's a bishop here on b7, maybe a knight or a pawn on c6. So, uh, alpha zero az decides to transpose the bishop to a different diagonal. Not a square, but a diagonal. And this will be this diagonal, just looking here at the king. And he decides to play bishop to d1. Queen e1 and bishop to b3. Right now it doesn't, it doesn't seem like much, like okay, the bishop is just jumped two squares, but in the future it will uh, be very, very useful. Rook d8 was played, rook to f3, now he decides to uh, transpose his rooks, queen d2 was played, queen g4, bishop d1, uh, there are some minor threats like rook takes f uh, f7, so the queen cannot take on h5, queen e4, and another interesting idea what was played by Alpha Zero, instead of taking on g6, which many of us would do very, very early in the game, he decides to play h6. If we take on g6, pawn takes on g6, then there is no advantage here. We just lost a few tempos. One, two, three tempos just, just on taking this pawn on g6. So Alpha Zero decides to play h6, and the idea is that uh, first of all, it weakens the back rank, so we have some back rank mate ideas, and white will also want to bring his queen on g7 at some point. Knight c7, attacking the rook, rook d6, knight d6, and now bishop to b3. The bishop comes back to b3 with a pawn sacrifice, another pawn sacrifice. So we have, so uh, alpha zero is two pawns down, 
and the whole idea was uh, for alpha zero to play rook to d5. What does it mean? I mean, the queen is just getting attacked, but it's, she's in the center, right? I mean, she can go whatever she wants to, e4, c7, a1, and h8, for example. Now, the idea behind this maneuver was, uh, the sacrifice, was that if the queen goes, let's say, to e4, now white can play queen b2 and eyeball this checkmate on g7. Still not a checkmate because of the, of the knight, but once we move the rook somewhere and we take the knight, there are lots and lots of uh, checkmate ideas. Okay, so in this position, again, uh, after white sacrificed the pawn e5, the queen has to, the uh, stockfish uh, realizes I have to keep the queen on this diagonal. But there are only two squares, h8 and a1. That's it. No, I can't go move anywhere else. Well, if I place the queen on a1, the idea, az's idea was to play rook to c3, completely cutting off the queen. And again, the plan is queen e3, queen e5, and queen g7 at some point. So, Stockfish decides to play queen to h8. Now, I gotta tell you guys, if you find yourself playing queen h8 or queen h1 in one of the games, it's not a good sign. So, queen b4 was played, attacking the rook, knight c5, and another amazing sacrifice made by AZ. Rook takes c5, pawn takes c5, but the whole idea was not to take back on c5. The whole idea is was to bury this queen on h8. Just to bury. How do we do it? Let's just forget about the, this attack right now. How do we bury the queen? We need to put a rook on f6. So that is the question. How do we put the rook on f6? Well, we play queen to h4. Also skewering the two rooks. Rook d to e8 was played, he has to defend, and rook to f6. Rook f8 and queen to f4. So look at this position. Just look at it just for a second. Let's just stop here. It's very interesting. Um, if you give it to a beginner chess player, just, let's say you just taught somebody how to play chess, what would they do? They would count the pieces. And you would say, okay, I have a rook and two pass pawns for a bishop. I'm better. I'm going to choose black. But if you uh, really give it to an experienced chess player, he's going to say, wait a second, what about this queen on h8? She's supposed to be worth nine points, but she's more useless, she's more useless than the rook here. Okay, so this is again, the beauty of, the, of this game is the positional understanding that uh, this artificial intelligence had. And basically, right now, black had nothing to do. He has to keep his rooks here to def defending the pawns on f7. The king has nowhere to go. The queen has nowhere to go. This pawn cannot go. So he has to start moving the pawns. a5, but well, that does not help him. g4, d5. He tries to sacrifice a pawn here on d5. Bishop takes. We keep the bishop on this diagonal a4 and g5, a3. And in this position, what actually wins uh, the game for alpha zero is the one thing that we haven't mentioned yet. And this is this pawn on a2. So every pawn matters. And now white just plays queen f3 and grabs this pawn on a3 and creates a passer. And a very interesting thing happens here. Uh, Stockfish Underst finally understands that this queen is completely useless on h8 and decides out, out of desperation to sacrifice the queen on f6. Pawn takes on, G on, on, G on f6, rook fc8, and this is pretty much lost. White just transposes his queen to a battle square and starts to push the pawn. And here is where the game ends because uh, there is just no way to uh, to stop this pawn. For example, if rook a7 and I play a5, if the rook takes on a5, I can probably just take on f7 check and there's going to be some kind of a some kind of a checkmate. Okay. So, this is in my opinion was probably one of the uh, best games in, in history, especially uh, between chess engines. So if, you, if, if the viewers at home have any questions, please comment on the video. Uh, you can uh, send 
an email to, to the chess club or email to my personal uh, email. Uh, my website is powerfulchess.com. Um, and uh, the final words, uh, for those of you who are uh, afraid of, uh, of the machines taking over the board, um, I have a message to the robots. We'll be back. Thank you.